Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Savannah. Glad we can come on out this morning. I hope we all are still stuffed from Thursday. Uh, that was, uh, you know, I, I, I ate a, a good, good amount, and uh, not too much, though. Um, but I, I certainly enjoyed my time with my family, and just uh, giving thanks for all the different things that we have. We have so much to give. I mean, it's sad that uh, we, we just write, you know, relegate it to one day. Like, okay, this is the day we're going to give thanks. Um, I think as we know, it should be uh, every day. Oh, hold on. My phone's kind of off. There we go. Um, and so, uh, but uh, as God's people, we're thankful all the time. And everything, give thanks. And so, uh, uh I'm glad, I'm thankful we're all here this morning. I'm thankful that I could be a, we could be a part of this fellowship, this congregation, and uh, oh, there's so many, so many things. Well, with that, um, there are a few things to announce. Um, first off is this Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m. It's the fifth Wednesday of the month, and I do apologize. It took us a, a few, few weeks to figure out what we were going to do, um, but uh, we uh, decided that I'm going to do a teaching on, not a, a full-blown, you know, 45 minute necessarily. So it's going to be a little, little uh, shorter than than normal, but um, still a good study on prayer in the church, um, and just uh, how uh, desperately we need it, and how important and vital it is as a church body. Um, it's not just uh, coming together on a Sunday and and singing and and opening your Bibles, but praying together is. Um, one of the common themes in the book of Acts. Um, and so we're just going to go over that and kind of hopefully be encouraged to, uh, to do that, to, to pray with one another. Not, not even just on our nights of, you know, our prayer nights that we have, the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Um, not just that, but just, you know, outside of these walls, praying together, meeting together, or even in, inside these walls. You know, when we see each other, hey, let's, let's pray. You know, oh, I, you're going through that. Oh, let's pray. Oh, let's pray for that. And so we also have the prayer chain, um, the email chain that you can be a part of as well to constantly be praying for things. You know, things pop up during the week. And we can pray for those things. And so uh, we're going to talk about that. And so I'm excited about that because I'm excited to study it and learn, learn a lot more myself. Um, and then share some of that with you guys. Uh, so that will be this Wednesday at 7. And then the following Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the month. And so we will be uh, continuing our study through the book of 1 Samuel. Um, we'll be in 1 Samuel 4 next week. Um, or two weeks. And, uh, and then also next Sunday is, com is the first Sunday of the month. And so we'll be having uh, sharing in communion. Um, and so uh, uh, we will have that as well next Sunday. We'll do the communion the first Sunday of every month, um, and I believe as of right now, well, um, and then just uh, just kind of a general announcement, you know, um, there are always things to do here at the at the church, always uh, available uh, places to serve, and so if the Lord's led you or called you, or you feel moved to do anything, just come see me, my, myself or Tim um, or Gerald after, and uh, you know, just say, hey, you know, I feel I feel called to serve. I feel called, you know, I want to be part of the body and, and serve in whatever way I can, um, and we can see uh, about fitting you in somewhere because there's definitely definitely um, tons of areas. You know, so people there's the the misconception that a small church has nowhere to oh I, there's nowhere no place for me to serve, um, but that's just because we're <laughs> we're doing a lot to make it work <laughs> in a small church, and so. Um, if, if the Lord's called you to do that, you feel that tug on your heart, come see us after. We'd love to uh, get you plugged in and, and, and um, part of the work and body. And so uh, with that, if you want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 19, we're going to finish up the chapter. And uh, today we're going to get into the, we've kind of begun the death of Christ, but we're going to finish the death of Christ. And so as you're turning there, we'll pray. Lord, I thank you so much just uh, for this morning and just for bringing us all here together, Lord, for bringing your body together, keeping your body together, working through your body, Lord. We know that right now you have a desire to speak to us. You know exactly what we need to hear. Some of us need encouragement. Some of us need exhortation. Some of us need conviction. 
Lord, but you know exactly what we need to hear. And so I pray that our hearts will be soft to what you have to say to us, not what we want to hear. Lord, I pray the words that I say would be nothing but your word, not my own opinions or thoughts or, or anything like that, but it would be what you have to say to your people, Lord. That as your sheep, we would be stuffed, <laughs> feeling stuffed as we leave here, just like we left the table a few days ago. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, as we finish the death of Christ, um, you know, what can I say? I mean, what can I say? What, what can I add to what, what the Lord has already done? Verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Well, going back to verse 28, it says, after this. After this, what was he, what's, John's kind of left out a lot, a lot of the things that have happened. As we've read through the Gospel of John, we've seen that John's Gospel has a lot of things included that the other three Gospels don't have. And the other three Gospels have a lot of things that John doesn't include. Um, and it's not because he's telling a different story. He's just telling a different angle to the story. One thing we saw, um, one thing we saw last or two weeks ago, because you guys were blessed to have Pastor Jason um, speak on patience last week, um, which was I was able to, to join in on that. That was awesome. Um, but a couple weeks ago, we saw John was at the cross. He was the only disciple that was still there with Jesus. See, in the garden when Jesus was arrested. All of his disciples scattered. We know that Peter and John kind of followed Jesus into the praetorium and into where um, Annas and Caiaphas were wrongfully accusing him and beating him. And then they led him to Pilate. And from that point, we kind of lose track of John and Peter. It's, it's most commonly thought that, you know, what it says that once Peter saw that he had denied Christ three times and he, he, he sees Jesus, he, he went away. So he probably went and thought about his actions for a little bit. John, however, we're not sure what he did during the time of Pilate. I'm sure he's there. I'm sure he's around Christ because he ends up at the foot of the cross. So he's the only disciple, really, that saw all these things happen. So even though the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about the crucifixion of Christ, they probably either got it from John. Hey, John, what happened? You were, you were the only one that was there when it happened. Or maybe it, it was just common knowledge and they just got it from everyone else but john tells again he tells a little bit different angle to the to the uh, story of christ but after this it says jesus knowing that all things were accomplished see jesus knew that all things had now been brought to a consummation and stood finished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled says i am thirsty that's how kenneth weist um, translates it in his expanded translation on the Greek New Testament. See, the three other gospel writers tell us that there was a three, right before this, there was a three hour period of darkness that happened in between verse 27, where it says that from that hour the disciple took her to his home, and verse 28. There was a three hour period of darkness. And it was during this time that all of God's wrath was poured out upon Christ for our sins. See, darkness in the Bible is a, is a common thread of, it's a common sign of God's judgment. Going all the way back to Exodus, when Moses is battling with Pharaoh to have the people released from Egypt so they could go to the promised land, you know, he has all those plagues that go on of him. And one of the worst plagues that happens during that time in Exodus 10 was that darkness was on the land of Egypt. Darkness was, the darkness was so thick that the Bible says it was felt. The darkness was so thick that a man would put his hand up in front of his face and could not see it. One thing we also know in that story in Exodus 10 that the darkness was on Egypt. However, where the Israelites were, where God's people were, it was light. God was not judging His people. He was judging the people of Egypt because of Pharaoh's hard heart. So we see there, and darkness was a sign of God's judgment. 
Also, looking to the future, in Revelation 16, one of the bowls of God's wrath, one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of God's wrath that is poured out upon the earth is darkness. Darkness in pain is what it says in Revelation 16. And then we see here, and again with the other three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they talk about a three-hour period of darkness. So dark, again, that no one could see um, what was going on. And, and even in extra-biblical, not even just the Bible, but historical documents, there's, that period of time is documented. Um, it's not just a, a nice addition to the story to spice it up that the Gospel writers added. This is historical fact, just like when Joshua um, stopped the sun <laughs> for a little bit so he could continue fighting. There's even other tribes and nations that were around that time that talked about an elongated day um, and so um, that's one thing you find is that the bible is not just supported by itself even though that should be good enough because it's god's word but god has been faithful to even include those other things to help support it so that man in his hard heart will, will hopefully soften his heart to the lord so there's just been this three hours of darkness and it's during those darkness that again God's wrath is being poured out. Now it's not being poured out on the people of Israel like it was with the people of Egypt. It's not being poured out on the whole world like it will be in Revelation 16. No, God's wrath is being poured out upon Christ Himself. Now, why, begs the question, what did Jesus do to deserve God's wrath? Well, as we've been studying the Gospel of John, and any good Bible student would know, nothing. He's done nothing to deserve God's wrath. But he's happily taken on God's wrath for us because of his love for us. The full wrath of God was upon Christ at this at these these three hours again an agonizing moment for Christ something we could never we couldn't endure a second of it for three hours he was enduring the full wrath of God and it wasn't like a like it, it started out small and it, and it you know it, and an hour and a half in it was like really bad and then oh then it crescendoed down and it was okay it was it was a little nicer for three hours it was the fullness of God's wrath upon him. But something else also happened at that time. Not only was he experienced the fullness of God's wrath, something, if you're a child of God, you can thankfully say you'll never experience. If you're not a child of God, it's something that, well, in fact, we all deserve. But something else was also happening as he's having that wrath poured out on him. But Christ was also separated from God. Something that he had never experienced before. And after that, will never experience again. See, Jesus is part of the Trinity. The Godhead, three in one. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And they're all three in one. They're all of the same. In the same. He's never been separate from his father even though he's on this earth he's still one with his father he, he mentions that many times i and my father are one he's never had that broken relationship he was there at the beginning at the beginning when it said god created the word for god is a plural form of god not plural in the sense of there was multiple gods because then it was said and god's created but a plur plural form of God. And then even later on when he's going to make man, he says, let us make man in our, in our image. And he was there from the beginning. He's the one who created. And when we, when we actually studied the first chapter of John, it says that the Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, and that Word came down and dwelt among us, speaking of Christ. And so, from eternity, he's never, ever experienced separation from his Father. 
Now we've all, at some point, we all or we will, experience separation from our parents. And for most of us, that was a good day. <laughs> yeah, finally out of the house. <laughs> Got to get out of there. Freedom. Not so with Christ. In fact, he, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He even says that the Father turned his face away. Why is that? Is that because God was like, he, he was disappointed in his son? Oh, you died for these people? You're, you're hanging on a cross? You're not sticking up for yourself? No. Because God cannot look upon sin. In fact, as the same writer, the same author, John, says in 1 John 1, and 1 5, this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, we have heard from Christ and declare to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. So when darkness is poured out upon Christ... God being light, he can't, he can't be in fellowship with him. Because there is no fellowship with light and darkness. John goes on to say, what fellowship does dark, you know, light have with darkness? They, can't, they don't coexist. Again, if we were to turn down all the lights right now and shine a light, there would be darkness and there would be where the light is. There wouldn't be like this mixture of like light darkness or dark light. <laughs> There's, there's no such thing. It's either light or it's dark. It's because Christ took upon all of our sin. All of it. The, the, the sins we've done, the sins we're doing, because that's, that's an everyday struggle, <laughs> The sins we're going to do. He died for that. He didn't die for us once we've cleaned ourselves up. He didn't die for the Christian versions of ourselves. <laughs> I'll die. You know, I'm, dying for the, the, I'm dying for Pastor Nick. Not dying for the other Nick. No, no he, he, he died for the other Nick. <laughs> It's because he died for that one that I, I'm, I'm even able to, to, uh, to be here. The, the, any of us are able to be here. It's because he took on all of our sin and, and God could not look on sin. Again, he is light and there is no darkness at all. Darkness can, does not dwell with light. There is a separation always. So for three hours he has been experiencing this full wrath, full separation, all of our sins. And <laughs> that's where we pick up at verse 28 after this. Now that darkness has been lifted and Christ has experienced the fullness of the wrath of God, he sees that all has fulfilled in order for him to, for him to die except for one tiny thing, <laughs> to cry out that he is thirsty, which is a reference to Psalm 22:15. He cries out, I thirst. I think it's just a powerful picture again of the humanity of Christ, even on the cross. He didn't, he didn't lessen his blow on the cross. He didn't like, okay, I'm going to be God when I'm hanging on the cross so this doesn't really hurt. I'm going to be God when I'm on the cross so that way, you know, it's, it's not, that, not that hard. Because again, crucifixion was was and is the most gruesome way you, someone could die. I mean, we, 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 in America, we're, we're, we freak out when uh, we think it's inhumane to inject someone with, to paralyze them first, and then inject them with something to, to kill them when they have the death penalty. The Romans would, would say, that's the, easy, that's the easiest way out. They would... Crucifixion, again, was one of the worst. The point of crucifixion was to make someone suffer. And I'm sure if someone had a, had a problem with that, they could find themselves up there with them. So again, we even see at the very end the humanity of Christ. I thirst. 
I mean, he could have he could have made it rain, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's still God, but he didn't. And then they they fill a sponge with it's this sour wine. This wine was um, the wine that actually was a very cheap drink that the the Roman soldiers would make. Um, it was kind of like the the low end, <laughs> something you'd find at the the Dollar Tree or something. The low end, you know, you're, you're not going to put that out on Thanksgiving. And then again, he, was, he wasn't asking. When you compare it to this very first miracle he did at the wedding of Cana, and he made the best wine that they've ever... T- where did this wine come from? Again, he could... Nope. He takes the soldier's nasty cheap stuff for his last miracle. His sacrifice had been complete. The transaction was done. And so he yells out, it is finished. See, the phrase for it is finished in verse 31 was a phrase that was actually common use at that time when a debt was paid in full. If you go to your bank, finally pay off your house, finally pay off that car loan, that personal loan. You know, the, the teller hands you the receipt back and they say, all right, you're done. You're, no more. Your debt's paid in full. Well, this is what he cried out. The debt has been paid in full. It is finished. Everything that's required for sin, the fullness of the wrath of God has been taken care of. I've taken care of it for you. That's what he's saying. See, Jesus paid our debt in full. There's nothing else we have to do. There's no like, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever had that where you, where you th- thought you paid off a loan and then you realized there was interest. There's like 68 cents still left on it. And then they send you the 90-day the notice and you know, they're repoing your car because you forgot to pay that 68 cents. That's not going to happen in heaven. We're not going to get to heaven and, and God says, you know, there was still 68 cents left of wrath that I hadn't poured out on you yet. And so you're going to have to spend 68 cents in hell first before you're going to be able to come to heaven. No. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. The transaction for our reconciliation back to God has been completed. And just like when you, re, you know, when you finally pay off your house or pay off your car, you get the title, you get the deed. Well, Christ got the title and the deed to our lives. Hey, hey, if we believe in Him. Paul speaks of the sacrifice of Jesus in this way in Ephesians 5. And walk in love as Christ also loved us. Again, showing that the, why He did this wasn't because He needed to. wasn't because He had to. wasn't because we made Him. It's because He loved us and He wanted to. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. That's how Paul speaks of the sacrifice of Christ. In fact, in the Old Testament, when they would have to sacrifice bulls and goats and all those things, when you read through Exodus... Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and it's going over all the ways, all the different laws of sacrifices. One phrase that keeps coming up is a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord, a sweet smelling sacrifice to the Lord. It's because a, a sacrifice of a pure heart is a sweet smelling aroma. God smells that just like just like maybe most of you on Thursday when you were smelling that turkey. Oh man, that smelled great. Or, or as we down here in the south when you barbecue. Man. I mean, if someone's barbecuing within a mile of your house, you can always smell it. And oh, someone, someone's doing something right today. <laughs> in fact, on, on 
Thanksgiving Day, someone in my mom's neighborhood was barbecuing, and all of a sudden I had the urge for, for pork. <laughs> Turkey was out of my mind at that point. But Christ's sacrifice was a sweet... That's why after three hours, the darkness was lifted. That's why Christ was still speaking after the full wrath of God was upon him. Because the, the sacrifice was sweet. God honored it. If God didn't honor Christ's sacrifice, then what we're doing right now is, is, is futile. We should all be sleeping in, getting ready for the football games, maybe barbecuing ourselves, you know, doing whatever we can to, to pay off our debt, spiritually speaking, because, hey, Christ didn't do it. But see, that's not the case. God saw it as a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, before we move on from this, I want us to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're just going to read, uh, I'm going to try not to really go over it. I just like to read it because I think the author of Hebrews. So Mark, keep your place in John 19. So we're going back, don't worry. But in Hebrews 10, it, it really talks about how, how Christ's death has fulfilled what, um, what we needed. So in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, it says, For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Again, right now Christ is dying at the Passover where they're sacrificing constantly. For then would... For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Again, there was one, once a year that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and, and offer sacrifice for his sin, for the nation's sins. But he had to do it every year because even they realized, hey, this isn't going to cut it. Verse 5, Therefore when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Because again, at this time when he's writing this, they still, they're still have the temple. They still are sacrificed. And they still think they can you know, take away their sins by the blood of bulls and goats and rams. But this man, verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Christ has done it once and for all. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, 
but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. We can go back to John 19 now. Again, I, I really don't see necessary to, to go over that one by one. I think he does a great job writing out exactly what Christ's sacrifice was for us. It was once and for all. We don't need to continually offer sacrifices to Him for our sins. Now, the Bible does tell us we need to confess our sins to Him and to one another continually. That's, a, that's part of the sanctification, the growing process. We're still going to sin. And He's okay with that because He already died for all of it. He wants us to stop. He wants us to, to move on, to grow. But He understands we still will. But we need to realize that what He has done, He has done once and for all, forever. You know, Satan is commonly called the, Satan is called the accuser in the Bible. The accuser of the brethren. Standing there, pointing his finger. Look at what Nick just did. You see what he just did, God? You call him your son? And then all God has to say, all, all Jesus has to do is, as our perfect mediator, as the book of Hebrews says, I've died for that. That's already been taken care of. I mean, Satan is, is the person bringing up someone's past. You know, if they if say they went to jail back when they were 18, 19, young and dumb. They went to jail for a month because they were with the wrong crowd. And 30 years later, someone brings it up and it's like, look what they've done. Hey, they already served their time. It's, the debt's been paid. That's what Satan's doing. He's, he's one of those gossip columnists <laughs> trying to bring up things, accuse people. And, and Christ sits there and says, my blood has covered them. The debt's been paid. They owe, they owe me nothing now. They, 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 the wrath of God is nothing on them. Now Satan, on the other hand, <laughs> he's got a future, not a good one. Verse 31. Therefore, verse of John 19, verse 31, Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Because the next day was the Sabbath, again, it was, it was, uh, it was the preparation days, and they, they didn't want the cross laying on the, uh, hanging on the Sabbath. They wanted to make sure the bodies were not left hanging overnight if they happened to die which was actually a command of God in Deuteronomy 21. We've seen throughout this trial and throughout Christ's ministry, these religious leaders try and mask their faithfulness to God. You know, even here, keeping a very obscure law about not letting any, any dead bodies hang on a tree overnight. And so they're like, hey, well, it's the Sabbath day, and if they happen to die, we don't want them hanging overnight because we won't be able to take them down because that'd be work and that'd be breaking the Sabbath. And we want to keep God's laws. So, uh, you know, I mean, because we're just perfect good old Jews. So they try. And then, then they ask them to break the crucified's legs. Now, actually, this would be a sign of mercy from them since it would quicken their death rather than elongate it. Because how, they, how the crucified people would breathe when they're being crucified is they'd actually have to, they'd be, they'd be hanging like this with their knees bent and then they'd have to lift themselves up in order to get a, get a breath and then they'd go down. So if they break their legs, then they can't lift themselves up, they can't breathe. And, and actually most people died, most people died in crucifixion of asphyxi asphyxiation couldn't breathe anymore. You think about all the other brutal stuff they went to. That's the way they die. Man. And so breaking the legs would quicken it. Hey, they wouldn't be able to pull themselves up. They wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. And then, you know, they die and then we can get their bodies down before the Sabbath. We don't have to, we don't have to break any God's commandments even though we just um, put an innocent man to death with, without any witnesses. False witnesses they were. 
And then in verse 32, Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones sh shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So first off, with the soldiers, they were trained to kill. And they were trained to know if someone was dead or not. So they go and they break the legs of the two thieves that are crucified on either side of Christ because it was apparent that they were still alive. Maybe they're begging, please, maybe at that point they're saying, please break my legs. I, I just, I want to, this is horrible. But when they get to Jesus, they notice something different with him. It is very apparent that he is no longer alive. And so instead of breaking his legs, just to be sure, they pierce his side. And what happens next is both a natural occurrence and a supernatural sign to even us today. See, when they pierce his side, again, he's hanging, hanging a little higher, you know, they say his, his feet is probably three to four feet off the ground. So he's about eight feet or so in the air. Eight, nine feet in the air. And when they pierce his side, they seem to have hit his heart, which would explain all the blood that flows out, but also the, the water pours out. See, we, not, not to, I'm not a doctor, so you know, don't, don't like come ask me like after service about something. I, have, I just stu I study this for this. But around our heart, we actually have this little membrane um, that kind of protects the heart. And uh, around that, when you pierce it, uh, if it were, you know, you pierce the heart, this clear liquid comes out that looks a lot like water, runs just like water. And so that, um, medically speaking, that would be why blood came out and then the, the water comes out as well. But this is significant not just because does it show that he actually died, but it also signifies in de his death in relation to what it does for us, what his death does for us, the blood and the water. The blood which came out first signifies the sacrifice and atonement that Christ made for us. Even as the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, that his blood has cleansed us, that his sacrifice, his blood is the one that has taken away our sins. And then the water which came out next signifies the cleansing from sin that his death has done. And again, even going back to Hebrews chapter 10, the, the washing of the water, the sanctification, purifying us. Just like, I mean, we, well, hopefully we do it with our clothes. We do it with our clothes. We put it in the washing machine. And what's in there? Water. Purifying, getting away. Wiping away the dirt, the stains. Do it with our dishes. We do it with all sorts of things. But not only that, but it also signifies the two holy sacraments that we participate in as a church. Communion, which is the cup, and baptism, the water. And the cup, remembering the blood that Christ spilt for us to wipe away our sins. And then baptism in the water, recognizing that we are now a new creation created in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. And so again, this was for them, this was good. For the soldiers, they were trained to know whether, okay, this guy's dead or not. And especially, we'll make sure, so we'll pierce the side instead of breaking his legs. We'll pierce his side, and we hit his heart, well, he's dead for sure now. So that's good for them, and, it, and it's great for us that Christ died. It's great for us. It's weird to think that, like we're happy someone died. I'm really glad that he died. Because when you read 1 Corinthians 15, 
And, and Paul talks about the resurrection of Christ. And he talks about how if Christ did not rise, then our faith is futile because Christ would have just been another guy that died. Or, or if we, we put it to the theory of a lot of conspiracy theorists out there, and they started in this day, by the way. It wasn't start, you know, hasn't been around just recently. They started this back in, back in biblical times. Where Christ didn't really die, he kind of passed out. And when he got to the tomb, you know, with the, the cold air and everything in the tomb, it kind of woke him up and revived him. And, oh, that was his resurrection. The swoon theory, as it's called. Or as, as John battled in his day, the Gnostics, who thought that, that Christ never came in the flesh. He kind of just came as a, a spirit. And he floated around. He wasn't walking on the water. He was just simply floating above the water. Well, if he was that way, then why would he say, I thirst there on the cross? Or there's even some who believe that Christ died and didn't rise from the dead, but it was kind of more of a spirit, an apparition that came. But one thing Christ, one of the one thing that we read about that Christ did after he rose from the dead is he had breakfast with his disciples on the beach. He ate he ate fish. Again, sign of his humanity. Now this is important because in verse thirty five, John makes it clear that this wasn't just a story he had heard from a friend of a friend, because he was actually there and saw it. He's actually seen Christ dead. He hears him cry, "It is finished," and he gives up his spirit. Again, you, throughout this whole process, you just see the control that Jesus has over the whole situation. I mean, Pilate was just, he was dumbfounded because he's like, look, I have the power to release you and put you to death. Why aren't you begging me for mercy, basically? Look, why aren't you putting up a fight for yourself? Jesus even said, no one has the power to take my life. I'm the one that's going to lay it down. Even in his death, the, he didn't die from asphyxiation. He didn't die from the nails or blood loss. He died because he gave up his spirit. He said, it's time. I'm done. The sacrifice has been made. The debt has been paid. I mean, he was, John wasn't just writing all this stuff to try and get on Oprah's book club or the New York Times bestseller list with all these stories. I'll spice it up here and spice it up there. No, he says that he testifies these things so that people will believe. His testimony is true so that you may believe. It's something he actually says again in, in chapter 20, speaking of the resurrection. Look, I write these things so that you will believe. He wanted people to understand that Christ did actually die and not just faint. Again, that was a common theory in those days. We even see after in, in, um, in the, uh, some of the other Gospels, after Christ died, the Jews go to Pilate and are like freaking out because they're like, look, he said that in three days he's going to rise. Can you put a Roman guard and, and seal it, seal the tomb to make sure his disciples don't come in and steal his body and say, look, he resurrected. I mean, they were, they were paranoid they're, for good reasons because everything Christ did say actually happened up to that point. And so they're thinking, well, if he says he's going to rise in three days, that might actually happen. So let's make sure it doesn't. And then they ended up paying off the guards when his tomb is empty and say, look, tell everyone that his disciples stole the body. I mean, again, the conspiracy started right at that point. And in John's day, uh, John lived till the ripe age of, of 90, 90 something. He was, he was the only disciple that wasn't martyred for his faith. But it's not that they didn't try martyring him. He was actually put in a pot of boiling oil. And he survived. And when they did that, he was like 70 or something, like 60, 70 years old. He wasn't a young gun. 
And then they, and then the Roman government banished him to the island of Patmos, where it was basically, you're just going to die out there. But he came back from Patmos. I mean, they're saying, you should, we can't kill this guy. But in his time, he saw a lot of stuff happen. And one, again, one thing that was going around was people saying Christ didn't actually die. John says, look, I was there. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm testifying. I'm not saying it because I want myself. Oh, John was at the foot of the cross still. John knows this. He says, look, I, the only reason I write this is that you will believe. And then even to add to his credibility, and to, more so to Christ's credibility, in verse 36 and 37, we see that even more prophecies are fulfilled by what happens here. Again, Christ is in complete, God is in complete control over this whole situation. I mean, that, the devil, th again, the devil thinks this is great. This is awesome. We see not one of his bones shall be broken. And they weren't. We see, and they, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That speaks of the soldiers going up to him and saying, oh wow, he's died. He's dead. And people walking by, seeing him. Well, verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Again, since it is almost the Sabbath, they make haste to take down the crucified. Now most of the time, they would simply throw the bodies in a ditch designated for those that were crucified. You know, I mean, because no one wanted them. They were kind of, you know, first off, in those days, especially at Passover time, touching a dead body would make you unclean. And so, with the other two thieves, it's just, they probably just threw them in a ditch. Of, and it sounds gross and nasty, but mm -hmm, that's what they did then. Threw him in a ditch and said, outside the city, this is where they're at. With Christ, though, and I'm sure Pilate, again, I mean, Pilate is such an interesting person in the story of, of Jesus. You know, he, he's really put in a, in a, in a hard spot, in a, and he's getting a lot of information, a lot of information. And he even sees at times, well, maybe this guy, this guy's innocent. Well, now he has Joseph of Arimathea, who was a prominent Jew at that time, come up to him and say, hey, I want the body of Jesus. What? It's Passover. If you touch that body, you're unclean. You can't take part in the Passover. You're prominent. Aren't you one of the guys that just killed this guy? <laughs> Aren't you one of the ones yelling out, crucify him, crucify him? He wasn't, but I'm sure Pilate just thought they're all, they're all in it together. And we have two people who would be unsuspecting at this point in time to see Christ after he's crucified. We have Joseph of Arimathea and Nic Nicodemus. Now the first is Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea is a, an interesting guy. It says that being a disciple of Jesus there in verse 38, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Now when it says secretly, it's not that he was necessarily hiding he was scared. It was more like an undercover agent. That's kind of how the, the Greek portrays it. He was put there undercover for God. It actually says in one of the other Gospels that, that he didn't consent to their deed of putting him to death. He didn't want him put to death. 
It's like, no, this isn't going to... I don't like how we're doing this. This is wrong. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a Christian pastor in Germany during World War II. Um, he's actually written one of the greatest... One of the Christian classics um, called... Uh, um, Cost of discipleship, <laughs> and he's one of the main. He's he's one of the only quali- one of the small. He's one of the only qualified people that could write that, because um, he in Germany he was a pastor during the rise of Hitler and the Third Reich, and um, he ended up dying for because he opposed Hitler. He opposed Hitler so much he actually wasn't. Um, there was a movie put out uh, with uh, a, within the last decade had Tom Cruise and some other guys in it called Valkyrie um, about an assassination assassination attempt on Hitler. Um, and actually Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of that plan to try and assassinate Hitler. He was part of actually a couple plans that never obviously never worked. Um, but it, it's kind of the same thing. He put himself in position. God, God really opened doors for him to get, get in places so that way, hey, he could reach people, but he could also accomplish his mission of trying to get the Third Reich out of Germany and out of, uh, the Third Reich out of the church. That was one of his main goals. And so that's kind of where Joseph of Arimathea is at. He realizes he's in a special place and that he could use his power for the glory of God instead of just being thrown out. And, and I pray that, pray that we have politicians like that in our government um, because uh, we need them. We really do. So Joseph of Arimathea, again, he's a prominent guy. He's a religious leader. He goes to Pilate. He asks for the body. But we also have Nicodemus. Nicodemus. We first met Nicodemus in John 3 when he visits Jesus by night. You know, and he asks him, hey, how, what do I got to do to be saved? You got to be born again. Born again. <laughs> you know, I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know if my mom's going to like that. Born again is not going to work. And he thought about it. And then in John 7, we see he actually sticks up for Christ. In John 7. In, in a council meeting. But one thing I, I, we find it in, throughout the gospel is it's mentioned in John 9 that there were actually many rulers of the Jews that believed in Christ but in secret because they feared the Jews. But we see these two guys, Nicodemus, who usually gets a bad rap in the Bible. But um, if you read the whole story, you'll see he shouldn't. And Joseph of Arimathea. Now when you look at the timeline of all this, you'll realize that they were prepared for his death. They had a bunch of of spices and myrrh that they wouldn't be able to go and just buy. Hey, Oh, Jesus died. Hey, Nicodemus, can you run to Walmart real quick and get a bunch of spices and myrrh? Or maybe you're going to have to go to, you know, go to Sam's Club to get more. You know, you're going to have to get the bulk, get it in bulk. No, there wouldn't really be anyone at this time especially open, especially with that kind of quantity. So they would have had to have these prepared. But not just that, but they had a new tomb that was already hewn out of stone right near the crucifixion, right in the garden next to the hill of Golgotha, right outside the city. That was Joseph's which was also a fulfillment of prophecy. They, they buried him in a rich man's tomb that was never used before. A brand new tomb, never used, owned by a rich man. And not just a rich man, but again, Joseph of Arimathea, a religious leader. Now, normally, I, I can only imagine when Joseph goes to buy this tomb and he tells him, all right, I need you to hewn, you know, ma- make this a tomb. The people working on it are, are probably saying, outside the city, you want to be buried? And Joseph, why are you getting a tomb? You're not going to die. You know, no one else in your family looks like looks unhealthy. What are you doing? It just reminds me of Noah in the ark, building this boat. What's a boat? See, at that time they didn't have boats. I didn't know what an ark was. Moses was just simply following the instructions God gave him and building. And, oh, whoa, that's a weird looking thing. 
What is this going to be used for? God says, you'll see. Joseph of Arimathea buys a, buys a tomb. And I'm sure maybe even, uh, this is just speculation, this isn't scripture, but I'm sure even maybe he wondered, what am I doing? Why am I buying a tomb? <laughs> a lot of people believe that he actually read, he went and read the scriptures and he saw, oh, Jesus is matching all these prophecies that the Messiah is supposed to fulfill. He's doing all these. And you know what? It says the Messiah is going to be killed. That the, that the Messiah is going to die, actually. And then he's going to be buried in a rich man's tomb. Maybe he understood it. He got it. He realized. It's really interesting that these men are the ones taking care of the body of Christ and not his disciples. I mean, at this point... At this point, his disciples are all gone. I mean, John, we're, we're still not sure. You know, maybe he, at this point he's he's taken uh, Mary home, and um, the timeline of that kind of gets, you know, he, maybe he saw this, maybe he heard that this was what happened after the fact. But it's really interesting that Nicodemus and Joseph, two religious leaders on the same council that just put him to death, are the ones doing this. And not only that, again, they touched a dead body, so now they can't take part in Passover. <gasps> well, see, to them, that didn't matter anymore. The Passover lamb had just been sacrificed. They didn't need to take part in the little Passover lambs that were sacrificed every year. Those were null and void. They weren't unclean anymore by touching the body of Christ. They were clean because they believed in Christ. And then in the other Gospels, we're told that many of the women that followed Christ followed his body to the tomb because they planned on coming back to apply some um, more of the burial spices. But as we're going to see next week, when they come back, they are met with the unexpected. And again, that's pretty important as well to the resurrection of Christ. These, these women didn't go to the wrong tomb. They went to the right tomb because they went and saw the tomb that he was buried in. And so for us this morning, I mean, in, in, a, in a sense, what can I add to what Christ has done? I mean, he's died for our sins. The, the, he's experienced the fullness of the wrath of God for us. He was, separated, he was separated from God so that we could be joined to God. And as Hebrews, the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, he's done it all. He's done it once and for all. We no longer need to, to do those things to try and... There's no 68 cents left on our balance of sin debt. It's all been paid. And the, rec the receipt is right here that shows the zero balance. There's no point in paying, continuing to pay on that loan It's foolishness. It's going to get you nowhere. The only place it'll get you is, is eternity separated from Christ. Or you can have eternity with Christ. Just like Joseph and Nicodemus. They believed Christ. They didn't worry about all the laws and rules. And, and at that point, they, they went to Pilate, the Roman governor, and said, we want his body. We're going to prepare it for burial. Joseph took a step of faith and, and had the, the new tomb. They had the, the spices ready. At that point, they were no longer ashamed of Christ because they saw His love for, him, for them on that cross. He could see it in His eyes, I can imagine. Now this morning, do you believe in the love that Christ has for you? That He died for you? And three days later, He rose again. It's going to take us seven days to get there next week, but in three days, He'll be out of the grave. 
bodily out of the grave. He did it for us so that we can be resurrected. We could have new life. That no, our sins no longer hang over us. For the wages of sin is death, Romans says. That's something we all deserve, but, but Christ took on the death for us so that we don't have to take it on anymore. And, and notice, all the stuff that he did was before his physical death. His physical death was not a thing. Yeah, okay, I'm going to die because I'm going to rise again. But it was the, spirit, the, the, the wrath that he took on, the separation. See, that's what he died for, for us. So do you believe in that this morning? And, and if you already believe, then this should be an encouragement, knowing that he doesn't hold those things against you because they were all put on his son Christ. Or, or maybe you don't. Maybe you've struggled with it. I mean, we could come here every, every week and struggle with it. Come here every week just because we're curious. Come here every week just because we think that this adds to our righteousness. What can be added to the death of the only begotten Son of God. Nothing. Nothing can be taken away from it either. So know that He's never... Know that if you believe in Him, He will no, no longer hold those things against you. You're really holding them against yourself if you don't believe. Christ, is, Christ has the receipt. I've paid it off. You no longer need to work. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you have paid off our debt. What a hefty debt that was. We, we, we can't understand or imagine it. We can't understand what it was like being separated from the Father because we were separated from the Father, but you have brought us into reconciliation. You've redeemed us, brought us at one. Or, or as atonement even says in its name, at one, to atone. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice you made. We praise you. Lord, let us every day remember the sacrifice you made for us. Let us live a life of, of freedom. No longer slaves to our, our fears, our anxieties, our worries, or our sins, Lord. Those things no longer have a hold of us. Death no longer has a hold of us. It could not hold you down and it will not hold us down. Lord, if we're your sons and daughters. I pray for anyone here this morning that might not know you. Maybe they've thought, they've wrestled. Or maybe they've just been working, thinking that's what you want. But you don't desire those sacrifices. You, the only sacrifice that was a sweet-smelling aroma to you was your son on that cross. And let us put our foundation in that. That you no longer see us as enemies, Lord. But see us as sons and daughters through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Pray we would leave this place remembering that and living that. Living a redeemed life. Living with the fact that we have been redeemed. That will change a lot of our lives. It already has. So I pray that you would be honored and glorified in all that we do, just like you were honored and glorified in the death of your son. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, why don't we all stand for this last song, and if you have any questions or prayer requests, or just want to talk or, or want to see about maybe how you can uh, serve in the body, uh, please come see me after. I'd love to talk and pray with you guys. You guys have a blessed week.